Hi, we're going to be talking about violence and sexual violence in this series. Please take care while listening. Welcome back to the official companion podcast of HBO's I'll Be Gone in the Dark. I'm your host, Nancy Miller. On this week's episode of the documentary series, investigators in Northern California try to make sense of why the East Area rapist attacks have suddenly stopped. What they don't know is that he's moved south, and he's now escalated into killing. So one thing that struck me throughout this series has been the frustrating limitations of the investigations at the time. From the lack of cooperation between police departments to the fact that rape survivors were often traumatized a second time when dealing with law enforcement and the judicial system. So that's what we're going to be talking about this week with retired Detective Carol Daly and Sheriff Kim Stewart, who have both investigated the Golden State Killer throughout the decades. But first, we'll hear from the documentary's filmmakers Liz Garbus and Elizabeth Wolfe on the uniqueness of these detectives and also how cultural shame held back most male survivors from wanting to share their stories for this documentary. Someone we meet who I think is very special to the series is the lone female detective, Carol. Carol Daly, yeah. Those who haven't seen the show, she looks kind of like Mrs. Brady and has this kind of like archetypal 70s shag, groovy mullet hair that I think is just fantastic. But there's something comforting about seeing Mrs. Brady. It's familiar and comfortable as you're watching. And I guess surprising, too. Mrs. Brady with a badge and a gun, though. (laughs) Holy shit. Thank you. And awesome wigs. She actually said she wasn't a big fan of her hair, but that she always felt when she was a police officer and a detective, these calls were coming in in the middle of the night. She had to get to that crime as soon as possible so she could just put on a wig and be out the door in five minutes. There was some practicality to it, too. Oh, yeah, of course. You slap on your action wig and you're ready to go. But seriously, we will learn later in the episode that it's actually about a lot more than hair. And it's kind of why Mrs. Brady is a baller. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so I just want to point out a really powerful moment in this series. It's when we hear from Gay Hardwick, who's one of the survivors, and as she's talking about what she endured, you two, as filmmakers, made the decision to focus on her husband Bob's face, which I think is an interesting choice. I'd love to know more about that. In terms of the choice of showing his face, you know, it's something that unfolds during the course of the series is how everybody who is impacted by the Golden State Killer, how their lives were altered inexorably. And we come to discover over the course of the series, and I'm not going to spoil it now, that, yeah, there was real fallout in the personal lives of the survivors. Bob is Gay's husband. He was there, immobilized while his wife was being raped. When we're talking to him, you can see his face wince, shrivel. You feel the pain, the guilt but something just very beautiful in his support and the peace that she is able to give him to forgive himself for not intervening. So his face was a focus for us because it's telling a whole story without words. It's a testament also to Bob and Gay's relationship that Bob was willing to participate in the interview. It was very difficult to find male survivors of this case that were willing to share their stories and talk to us. He was reluctant, but Gay said that this was important for her to share her story, and he supported her. Well, I'm sure that it was hard for him to do because he's not just remembering the feeling of helplessness. It's also the trauma of knowing that if he moves, his wife would be killed. And it seems like maybe back then, cops and detectives didn't know how to help survivors like Gay, and definitely not Bob. Liz, can you speak a bit on that? There was not a language or a protocol developed to deal with rape victims. And I think that that is what Gay is expressing, that there was the trauma, of course, of the crime and then the trauma of the aftermath, where your body becomes a crime scene. Looking at the police reports, we don't just have to take Gay's word for it. I mean, you can see the way that the police were talking about the survivors' reactions. One of them called them unemotional or flat, you know, not understanding the way in which shock could affect a person after 
after a rape or talking about the killer picking the pretty one. This kind of language just showed so little understanding about the violent crime these women had just endured. We'll be hearing more about that from Detective Carol Daly and Sheriff Kim Stewart in a moment. Thank you for joining us again, Liz Garbus and Elizabeth Wolf. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nancy. With a case that spans more than 40 years, there were a lot of detectives and cops who were working to solve it. And I'd like to introduce two standout figures. First, Detective Carol Daly, who was one of the original detectives on the East Area Rapist cases back in the 70s. Hi, Carol. Hi, how are you? Great. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you. And I'm also joined by Sheriff Kim Stewart, who, back in Santa Barbara in the 80s, was trying to catch the man she knew as the original Night Stalker. Hi, Kim. Hello, Nancy. Glad to be with both of you. You two have never actually met. No. Is that right? I don't even think Carol has any idea I exist, but I certainly know (laughs) she does, and I'm so (laughs) pleased to be speaking to you, ma'am. It's a pleasure. Yes, it's nice to meet you, too. You both feature pretty prominently in the very long arc of this case, which is incredible. And the case really starts, at least chronologically, with Carol. Carol, I think something that people are going to be really struck by when they see this series that you were really close to in the 1970s as a detective is how police handled sexual assault cases back then. What was a typical day like for you on the job before the East Area Rapist case? Typically in the 70s, when a rape case came into the detective division, female officers didn't respond in the field to the rape cases. We'd walk in in the morning and the commanding officer, our lieutenant, would have all of the reports and he would assign them out. And it wasn't long before I just ended up working all of the rape cases that came in. So female detectives at that time, we weren't involved in the active right after investigation. And of course, a lot of these happened in the evening and we were not called out. So responding to a, what you might want to say, a hot crime didn't really happen until we formed the task force and I was responding to all of these area rape cases. Kim, as you're hearing this, is your jaw dropping or are you like, yeah, that sounds about right? No, you know, what's interesting, though, about Carol's experience and mine is that Carol's experience really began the path that I came into in 1980, where I go into patrol. I ended up working in Santa Barbara, where only women could talk to women. Only women could take rape reports in the field. So Carol's experience is males in the field doing it. Well, when I went to Santa Barbara, there were five of us or so that were spread out in the criminal division, sex crime investigator, a criminalist, and three or four of us in patrol. And we were all on different shifts. And I'll tell you, Carol, it took me about 30 years to realize why we were on different shifts. We were on different shifts so that we could handle every rape call that came in. And that's what we did. Carol, did you get any training back then on how to interview victims or... Were you relying on your own experience and, for lack of a better word, intuition on on what to say? Basically, the first interview that I did was just trial and error. And I think you just draw on your own experiences and as you're interviewing someone. And I always tried to put myself in the woman's shoes and try to be gentle and trying to support them all along, let them take their time in making their report trying to console them, let them cry. If they needed to cry, stop the interview if it needed to be stopped. And there are things that you kind of do automatically when you're taking care of people, kind of that golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And it always worked for me. I have been amazed over the years of victims who will tell me what I did when I was with them and I totally forgot just because it was the right thing to do and you don't think about it. Oh, I'd love to hear an example of that. Well, one of the East Area Rape victims who was just 13 years old at the time, after we did the interview and everything, it was close to her birthday. So a couple of days later, I go to her where she lives, and as she's coming back from school, I get out of the car, and I had a, a birthday present and a card for her. And she said, I will never forget that. So kindness, patience, 
and explaining to a victim that for everything the rapist did to you, it's a separate charge. And so if he gets off on one charge, we still have other charges. And as long as you explain the process and why you're asking the questions, it seems to work out. Something that I think is really interesting and a detail that I would love you to speak to is one of the recollections of a victim is that you, Carol, showed up in full makeup and hair and that there was something about that presentation. Yes. I took the victim into the bedroom at the crime scene and I'm talking with her and she looked at me and she said, thank you for showing up all dressed up and having makeup on and letting me know that it's okay to be feminine. It just took me back because I wasn't prepared for that comment. And I wasn't prepared for that being important to her. Superman has his cape. Wonder Woman has her lasso of truth. I understand that you kept a wig by your bedside oh, yes. as your sort of action item. I've got to hear more about that, please. I get a call in the middle of the night and officers are at the crime scene and I need to respond. Within 15 minutes, I can be out of the house. I always had my clothes all laid out. I shower the night before, throw some makeup on and throw my wig on and I'm out the door because time was of the essence. I was driving 90 and 100 miles an hour to a crime scene, got stopped twice by CHP. As soon as they saw me who I was, I'd been all over the news. They said, hurry and get there. So just drive careful. <laughs> And especially, we were trying so many different techniques in trying to identify who the rapist was. And one of the techniques that we were doing at the time, and we only did it a couple of times, was trying to take fingerprints off from the body with iodine fuming. So that was another very, very difficult thing in taking one of the victims into the bedroom and saying, okay, where all do you think he touched you? And then me warming up the pipe and trying to blow iodine on her body. And we both started giggling because it was mm -hmm. just, I, I don't know, it was just something that you would never think about doing. And of course, we only did it a couple of times because fingerprints didn't last that long. There were a, a lot of different things that our victims went through at the time. First, we get to the hospital with Jane Carson, and I can mention her name because Jane's been very, very open. So we sat there and we waited and we waited and we waited. And so we worked with the hospital and we said, we cannot bring a rape victim in sitting in the lobby with everybody staring at her. So they set up a little room where we could have privacy. And then we said, we need a doctor who knows what he's doing, a gynecologist to do the examination because it was just whatever doctor was on duty. So we need a specialist to come in, do the exam, and make sure the evidence is all saved. So there was a lot that had to be done in working with the hospitals. And we look back, and there are mistakes. And I can look at a couple of mistakes that I made, and I just wanted to make sure I never did it again, because here again, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the victim and how they feel. Mistakes of insensitivity? You know, um, like with Jane, we get to the hospital and we're waiting and waiting and waiting. And my office is saying, we got to have your report. Get here and get your report done. I said, you know, we're still waiting. Finally, Jane's husband was on his way and was almost to the hospital. And I said, Jane, because your husband is almost here, I have got to go to the office. She was the only victim I ever left alone. I felt so horrible after I did that. So you learn from experience that you never leave a rape victim alone until you have all of the support, either family or rape crisis center or counselor, somebody there to pick up from where we left off. Kim, I'm curious to hear, you're an active sheriff. How have the protocols changed? It's interesting to hear Carol speak because they've changed and yet they've kind of taken the same route that she realized long ago. And I have to say that the East Area Rapes probably pushed her agency into more of a progressive or more current stance. Carol, would you say that? I mean, it moved yes, you absolutely. From, sure. Yeah. It, and that's what we have today. So when she says the victim has never left, that is accurate. And Carol might have a comment about this. Is We only interview the victim once. Now, when I did these at a street level, I, of course, interviewed the victim. And I did a report, and then I would uh, turn it in. And two or three days later, a detective would get it, as Carol was assigned, so were ours. And they would go back and interview the victim again. 
And then you would end up with uh, rape crisis counselors interviewing them, and you'd get something slightly different. And the problem became is by the time we got to prosecution, the first comment would be, well, she's changed her story. Not significantly, I'm going to add. And yes, it's because as Carol would know from all of her interviewing, things come to these women later on. They come to them in pieces. The story doesn't just come out all at once in perfect chronology. So in my experience, I would often hear that, well, you know, we're, we can't really prosecute. She's changed her story. Well, my question mm-hmm. is, how much? And are we talking about, well, he had on uh, Nike tennis shoes and not Adidas? I mean, let's let's be real. <laughs> you know, these are mm-hmm. traumatic, traumatic incidents. And I've talked to victims of this years after it's happened, I'm sure, as Carol has, where they said, you know, I just remembered five years ago, X. Correct, Carol? Right. One of the victims of the East Area Rapist, when I spoke with her just a couple of years ago, said, Carol, I never did tell you about this part of the assault because even now it is so embarrassing to me, I can't even talk about it. So, yes, we know that there are some things that uh, they block and maybe they'll remember later or they just can't talk about it at the time. And back in 1968 and early 70s, when these rapes occurred, they were misdemeanors and there was only a one year statute of limitations. We had to work really hard to get an arrest made to start the process going before that year was over. A year statute of limitations on a rape case. So if you didn't catch the perpetrator within a year, it was poof. Right. Right. Yes, in 1978, Governor Brown, because women were marching and demonstrating, he made stiffer rape penalties that were signed into state law, and it made it a felony, which gave us three years at the time, which was a little bit more. But there were some victims who said, within a year, what good is it going to do to make a report? But I can't think of any of them who were difficult victims to interview. They wanted help. And then, of course, as the rapes continued, all of them were doing whatever they could to help us try to identify the guy. All right. So here we are. This is the 1970s. We're in Sacramento. And Carol, you're the lead detective. Kim has established that because of the prolific nature of the East Area Rapist, you are now pushing a frontier in exploring the treatment and the process of gathering information from rape victims And it all comes down to the details, from the shape of the knot to the dishes. These details are critical in capturing knowing it's the same guy. So, Carol, as you're working on these individual assault cases, what patterns were you starting to see? We were starting to see the approach coming in, the flashlight shining in the eyes of the victim, talking through clenched teeth. Don't move. I'm just here for something. I'm not going to hurt you. Don't move. Don't move. And then just the length of time in the house, the rummaging through the house, the eating, the back and forth. I've never worked a case where a rapist was in the house as long as the rapist was with the East Area rape cases. And it was always anywhere from maybe an hour and a half to two or more hours because he was back and forth. They could hear him eating, opening and closing the refrigerator. They could hear him opening and shutting doors. And each time he came back, there may be another assault. So that was what differentiated these cases from other rapes. And at what point did you realize that this might be the same guy? I had responded to rape case number two. By the time we got to number five, we're thinking maybe the two of these are tied together. So it was still a little bit of time before an actual task force was formed. But our task force was huge. We had specialization in everything from neighborhood canvas to the crime scene investigation to the interview of the victim to interview other people in the house, the neighbors. There was just a lot to be done. So we would have sometimes 20 specialists responding to a crime scene. We'd have FBI there. We'd have our criminalists. We'd have a DA response. So we had a whole team of people that knew exactly what they had to collect and what they had to do to move these cases forward. At what point did you suspect or were even potentially convinced the cases happening outside your jurisdiction were related? 
Well, probably one of the first cases was when he moved to Stockton, but we got wind of that. And I actually went to Stockton and interviewed the victim. After that, outside agencies didn't want anybody from our department coming and interviewing victims. But there was so much notoriety in Sacramento, so much publicity. Every rape was front page, great big headlines, rape number eight, rape number 10, rape number 12. And we had huge community meetings with five and 600 people. The word got around, so we were able to tie some of the other rape cases in to the jurisdictions around us. His violence was escalating with the victims, and I just was so afraid that one night my call would be to a homicide scene instead of to a rape case. And then he left our jurisdiction, and we didn't hear anything. He was in other jurisdictions, and then things were kind of quiet. And I left the task force. As soon as we knew that we had no more rapes, I asked to go back to the homicide detail. And I was reading one of the headlines, and it said that I hated what men could do for a time, and the only man I liked was my husband. And I think that probably offended the male officers I worked with, because I worked with some great guys. But that was just the way I felt at the time. (laughs) There's a great line in the HBO series where someone says, Sacramento lost its innocence. Oh, yes. You didn't know who you could trust. People were walking down the street and they were sizing up. How tall are you? What color hair do you have? What color are your eyes? We didn't know who the rapist was. We suspected, because we had the two military bases here, we had the two Air Force bases, we suspected that he was military and we also had a strong feeling that he could be law enforcement. So we looked at everybody. We were eliminating people on men on our department that fit the description. We were looking at people in the military. We were looking at FedEx, UPS drivers. We were looking at everybody in the community, but people were buying locks. They were buying guns. They were shooting at anything that moved in the yard. You have women who stayed up all night listening for noises and could not sleep until early morning when they felt that they were safe. There was so much fear and terror in the community at the time. Yes, it was not a sleepy, quiet community that Sacramento used to be. I'm going to switch over to Kim for a moment. Okay, Kim. Nine years after the first East Area Rapist case, you're almost 400 miles away working in Santa Barbara. And this is where the man who would be called the original Night Stalker emerges. So how did you first hear about that string of burglary homicides? In 1983, I leave Southern California law enforcement and I go to Santa Barbara. And I left a suburb in Southern California, Cypress, California, a bedroom community, but it was a busy, on the southern border of L.A. County. We had quite a bit of crime. Mm -hmm. And I go to Santa Barbara, and it's this kind of bucolic, much slower moving, much older neighborhoods, you know, established areas. So it's a very different situation for me. And the first thing I even hear of this, I'm on patrol, and there is a call for a found bike in the middle of the night. On the radio, they said, proceed to your location or whatever the code was. And well, I'd been there three months, four months, and I thought, what are we doing? Nobody mentioned this to me. And the field supervisor says, meet me at this location. And that happened to be in my beat that I was responsible for that area. He said, this is why you're here. And he begins to relate to me about our homicides, the two attempt homicides, Himmel and Hornick. And I'm flabbergasted, (laughs) to be honest with you, because there wasn't that level of crime there. There were a lot of rapes, a lot of rapes. And it was kind of written off as, well, that's because we have UC Santa Barbara and college, you know, sort of like comes with the territory and so on and so forth. And it was horrifying to learn that these Things had happened, and there was like not a lot of urgency about it. So they were acting like these were really cold, old cases, when in fact, there wasn't very much before I got there. So you're saying 1983, you're in Santa Barbara, and there are a series of rapes. And the response that you're getting is, this is just part of the territory. Yes, it is. Yes, because I was the only woman on my squad. I was investigating rapes probably every 10 days, 12 days. And and they were acting like, oh, yeah, that's just, you know, that's the way it is here. And it's because we were a college town and blah, blah, blah. So then to discover 
there's huge amount of prowling. There's a huge amount of residential burglary. And then we had these horrific crimes not too many months before I got there. And they're acting like these horrific homicides had not even really occurred. And I'm thinking, well, this is unsettling. And I can't tell you the number of nights I spent with the windows down, the radio turned down, going through those neighborhoods looking. Wow. And I'll tell you something. I, I, I'm sure Carol might relate to this. I scared myself silly knowing some of these details. And my thought often was, my God, if I confront him, somebody's going to be dead. You could tell. You know, I mean, it doesn't take a leap of imagination to realize that. And so I go to homicide and say, hey, remember remember these cases, Domingo Sanchez? Do you remember uh, Himmel Hornick? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, we know who did that. And from then on, the door closed. So when I was first involved in this, it was sort of like, well, you know, yeah, things happen, you know, things happen. I want to pinpoint this moment where it's easy for me to look back in time, the 70s and 80s. But as you're speaking about it, it's like some sort of groovy 70s montage of things all blurring together. There is no connection at this stage between ear and someone who'd be known as ONS in retrospect. And they referred to these as the Night Stalker case when they were talking to me about it. But again, it was more of a label, not necessarily we think the same person is doing this. It's not till, you know, I'm there until 89 that I began to find out that they had focused on who they thought committed these crimes. So help me understand, because I can hear frustration in both of these stories, compounded by the frustration that there is so little interdepartmental communication happening. This is a big question, but why weren't these jurisdictions sharing information? You had it. Well, Carol brought up the perfect thing. They didn't even want someone from an outside agency interviewing their victims. So that is when she said that, I just had to laugh because, oh, my God, we're not sharing anything. If we shared something and let's say Sacramento solved these cases, oh, my God. Right. We can't have that. Right, Carol? (laughs) Right. So then going back to when these cases were happening, remember what our technology was. We didn't even have cell phones. So we had we finally got pagers and we'd get a a phone now. And sometimes they would put 911 after the number, which means call the office immediately. And so we'd have to stop at a restaurant, a gas station, (laughs) pay phones. We always kept money for pay phones in. And interagency correspondence came through teletype. Yes. And so you would get these teletype messages, which didn't have a whole lot of detail or anything. And it wasn't until years later when Lieutenant Shelby and Sergeant Bevins really felt that our rape cases might be tied to the homicide cases. And they went down and talked to the jurisdictions. And then we had somebody else in our department said, no, 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 that's BS. They, you know, they're not connected at all. And so it wasn't until 2001 when the DNA made the match. And I get the phone call from Sheriff Lou Blanis, and he said, Carol, you're not going to believe this. And he said, we have matched all of our rape cases with the homicide cases down south. And I just, I said, I knew, I knew, I knew that he was a violent man ready to kill. When you got this information, was this like, oh, this is a blast from the past. Who, East Area Rapist? Or was this like... I've been thinking about this dude every single day. Oh, no. There is not a day went by in my whole life that I have not thought about the victims of the East Area Rapist, who it was. And I've stayed in touch I mean, all throughout my career and then into my retirement. Officers that were actively working it who had retired, got their private investigator licenses, and worked it clear up until the day they knew that he had been identified, were communicating with me. We were talking about it and the possibilities. So it never left me. I don't think there is one investigator who ever worked these cases that ever let it go out of their mind. Sounds like that's the same for you, Kim. It it truly was, but it was in such a different way because my door there was shut on these cases. You know, I said, let me see the, can I read the murder books? Uh, We called them the murder books. Oh, no, no, no. We we know who did that. We know Brett Glasby did that. Brett Glasby, you know, those are closed. Those are closed. 
So I have this kind of weird introduction, very brief to this whole matter, and then years later come into this revelation. And Carol's right. I mean, we had limited the teletype. Oh, my God, I could barely read those. I would read the newspaper in different areas as a detective and then call the agencies and say, hey, Santa Barbara City, you had X on this date. We had Y on this border with your city. Are we related? You know, could I talk to those detectives? That's how I did it. Because she's right, there really wasn't communication. And then even when there was, they weren't real willing to communicate with each other. I'm picturing like a guy with a comb over in the 1970s chomping on a cigar being like, we got it. Like so, <laughs> something out of an old movie. Is this what, when you say they, is that who you're talking about? Well, Like big mustaches <laughs> and b- bad attitudes? Well, it was sort of more stuck in their ways. When I'm in the academy, I'm told, okay, If you have a burglary and one earring and some change is taken, loose change, that's a juvenile committed that. And if they're prowlers, they're not burglars. If they're burglars, they're not rapists, okay? Because what they're trying to do, and I certainly understand, they're trying to kind of train anybody to be a detective, right? Like, well, if we make them check all these boxes, they will have an understanding of being a detective. I'm sure I'm not alone thinking this, that a good detecting is an art and a science. And it's hard to teach the art part of it. You know, my trainers are saying, well, they only took one earring. That must be a juvenile. I'm sure Carol can recount to you several things taken out of her cases where it was one earring or change or food. So, Kim, let's fast forward. It's 2008. And you discover the East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker are the same guy. The weird thing is, you find this out while watching a cold case TV show. Is that right? Yes. So I think it was on Arts and Entertainment. And I don't generally watch those. To this day, I don't. I have enough of that happening. I don't need to. I I couldn't sleep. And I get up and I turn on the television and I see a face with a Santa Barbara Sheriff uniform and think, huh. I haven't been gone that long. I don't recognize him. I was just thinking about it. I started listening to it. And all of a sudden, he is talking about this enormous amount of rapes in the East Bay being tied by 2001 to many of the homicides by then, right, in Southern California. And I am flabbergasted. I had no knowledge. And You know, I've been asked many times, why did you get interested? Well, anger fuels a lot of initiative. (laughs) And I was mad. I was mad that I had a very high solve rate. I had a good handle on those cases that were in my beat. And to be honest with you, I felt we did a a really poor job. I felt Santa Barbara Sheriff let down those victims. We, being me, myself, and I, we're going to find out (laughs) what's going on. Obviously, you and Carol both share this very strange combination of isolation because you know that there's something bigger than this. But also, so many law enforcement, they were also thwarted by this case that bedeviled many people, including Michelle McNamara, who was also on the message board of that A&E show. And that's how she got sucked into it, too. So I'd love to be able to just get us up to date into 2018. The Golden State Killer, as he's now known, is arrested. Carol, where were you and how did you feel? I'll never forget. Sheriff Scott Jones called me. So I look at the phone. I thought, okay, why is the sheriff calling me? Because I hadn't really worked personally with him. And he said, Carol, you're not going to believe this. We've identified who the East Area Rapist is. And I said, you've got to be kidding. And he said, no, as a matter of fact, he is in booking right now. The first words out of my mouth were, you have to let the victims know immediately because they had been left out of all of the updates all through the years. And I said, we've got to start calling them. And he said, we'll get busy and start calling them. And I thought, okay, well, I'm retired. (laughs) But yeah, I've, I've had a lot of contact with the victims and I know exactly who I'm going to call. And I got on the phone and I started making phone calls because they needed to know before it hit the news that the East Area Rapist had been identified. And so 
these phone calls, I thought, okay, I'm going to make a quick phone call. Well, they weren't quick phone calls because the victims are in shock. They started calling. They wanted to know the details. And I finally had to say, look, I have other phone calls I have to make. I am so sorry, but we've got to get this done. So I know exactly where I was. And I will always be grateful for him calling me and letting me know and allowing me to call some of the victims myself. Kim, I really want to hear the same question. Where were you? What was running through your mind? So I was running for sheriff at that moment, and the news was going to come over or I was going to be interviewed relative to the sheriff's race. And the television was on with the news, and it was sort of a, a blurb. You know, the East Area Rapist Golden State Killer has been arrested. And I thought, that you know, that can't be possible. And then I thought, well, I know who knows. So I called Melanie Barbeau. Melanie is uh, known as a social worker who is a citizen sleuth. And the two of you had already been in communication about this case, right? Yes. Melanie picked up on like half a ring. (laughs) And she goes, yes, yes. I cried. I cried because it was just remarkable. And it is one of those dates, you know, in your life where you'll just never, never forget it. This is a case that dogged you for X number of years, and you were able to collectively, it was solved. Does that mean that there's now like, ah, oh, you can sit back with your brandy snifter and relax? Or is it then replaced with like a cartridge with a new case that you obsess about? Well, for me, here's what my hope was in participating in general with this effort is that I want people who are sitting out and maybe hearing this or watching this series and say, you know, long time ago, I saw X and I I didn't really think it was important or I didn't want to bother anybody with it. But, you know, a day later, there was a homicide and maybe it's related. I want those people to come forward. That might be the one part of the puzzle that we don't have. I want people to realize that there are people like Carol and I and countless others who never give up. We never give up. Kim, you're an active sheriff, and we're like looking back at 40 years ago or 30 years ago and some sepia-toned, that's the way it was then. But let's talk about the way that rape investigations are now. You know, there have been tremendous strides, I think, at a street level, and by that I mean the initial contact and then the subsequent investigation. But we need to uh, move into the area of technology. Uh, We need to bring rapid DNA to our jurisdiction. We need to bring it across the country. Right now, it's it's not being uh, used in a lot of areas. Its use is limited. And if I can take a machine out on site and collect swabs there and run them into the comparison of, of DNA data on scene and with great certainty identify someone within a few hours, I think that's where we need to go. (laughs) The art of all of this is not only being intrepid and persistent investigators, but it's also using the technology we do have access to that is working. And uh, DNA is obviously working in terms of homicide across the country. Well, there's no reason it can't be as important of a tool for rape cases. In my mind, Rape has to become of the same level of importance as homicide. That's just the bottom line. So, Carol, what does it feel like to have a 40-year weight lifted off of your shoulders? Or is that even the right description? Help me understand how it feels to have a 40-year-old cold case go away. For me, how it feels is the reality of the trauma on victims never goes away. And seeing their reaction at the time of the arrest and now waiting for the court process and all of the anxieties that they have and their feelings, and all of them have different feelings. Some of them have put it aside. Others are still dealing. Some are still going to counseling. And for me, the most heart-wrenching part is seeing what these victims are still going through 40 years later. And how do you support them and how do you help them through this process? 
I would just go back to when Emory Schubert, our DA, took office in Sacramento. She had, was a teenager living in our community at the time, and the first thing she wanted to do was form the statewide task force and be able to solve this crime. And she worked and worked and worked at it, and the people from so many different agencies I have people coming up and saying, thank you for arresting the East Area Rapists. Well, I didn't do it. My part was years ago. But all of the agencies that worked together, the officers who worked as hard as they could and wanted to identify, they're the ones that get the big pat on the back as far as I'm concerned. Yes, but I got to say, Carol, you were there for these survivors when they needed it most. And they still remember you for it. And that's huge. Thank you. That feels like a great place to end. Thank you both so much. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Carol, okay. it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. From the bottom right. of my and, heart. And and maybe at some point we might even meet each other. Thanks. Let's make a date, okay? That would that would be super. I'd love it. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. That's it for this episode. Many thanks to Liz Garbus, Elizabeth Wolf, retired Detective Carol Daly, and Sheriff Kim Stewart for joining us. And thanks to everyone listening at home. We'll be back next week with former cold case investigator Paul Holes as we take a closer look at how DNA has been used to crack open cold cases, including the Golden State Killer case. You can listen to that episode right after the fourth installment of All Be Gone in the Dark, which premieres next Sunday, July 19th at 10 p.m. Eastern on HBO. I'm Nancy Miller. This podcast was produced by HBO in conjunction with Pineapple Street Studios. Our team at Pineapple Street Studios includes executive producers Jenna Weiss-Berman, Max Linsky, and Barry Finkel. Our managing producer is Gabrielle Lewis. This episode's lead producer is Emmanuel Hapsis. Our associate producer is Janelle Anderson. Our researcher is Melissa Slaughter. And our editors are Maddie Sprunkheiser and Joel Lovell. Our engineer is Noriko Okabe. Original music by Andrew Epen of Basement Crafts. And special thanks to Liz Garbus, Elizabeth Wolf, and Kate Berry, and everyone else at Story Syndicate. This podcast couldn't exist without you. If you like the show and you have a minute, you can review and rate this podcast via Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you might get your podcasts. It really helps people find the show. You can also stream it on HBO and HBO Max. Until next week. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you can get help by calling the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN. You can call their 24-hour hotline at 800-656-HOPE-HOPE, or visit hbo.com gone for more resources.